Hello everybody and welcome back to The Cryptid Iceberg. I know I said it would be a couple uploads before we got back to this series, but I got excited so we're doing it now. I also said I was going to try to make each upload two tiers at a time, but then I really got into research for this tier and I'm also sick so I didn't want to take the time to do a second tier. Uh, so this series may just end up being 18 videos long, which isn't something I've never done before, but I don't know if I want to do that again. Nothing on this channel set in stone. Some of the videos will probably be one tier, some of them could be two. Who knows? But with that being said, today we are on to tier four. Not a lot to point out besides that. Things are going to continue to be weird and strange. The only thing I've done is I've made the words smaller on the whiteboard because like we're only on tier four and we've already taken up like half of it on the last episode. So I just crunched everything down so hopefully we can fit it all up here by the time the series is done. But yeah, you know the drill at this point, so let's go ahead and get back into the thing I decided to do with my life instead of finishing college. Before we continue our expedition into the weird, let's talk about something else that's weird. You. And specifically, why you've yet to get in on today's sponsor, AG1. Freak. Because at this point, you should know that AG1 is our one and only comprehensive foundational nutritional supplement. Because let's face it, I'm making YouTube videos, you're watching YouTube videos, neither of us are taking care of ourselves the way we're supposed to be. But now, AG1's here to help. That's because AG1 contains things like your daily dose of pre and probiotics, nutritional support supplements, immune supplements, as well as multivitamins and multiminerals, and instead of this being a couple dozen different pills and doses that you have to take every day, it is instead just one drink. And that one drink supports everything from your brain to your gut to your whole body in one easy step. And when I say easy, I mean easy. Because all you need is a spoonful of AG1 and 12 ounces of water and you're ready to start your day. AG1's been leading the pack since 2010 and it's not hard to see considering how easy and effective this one drink can be. And when you put the things into your body that your body's craving, you'll be amazed with how much more energy and things you can get done throughout the day. It's not like AG1's a miracle tonic that's going to fix all your problems, but it can give you the energy to fix them yourself. And if you've heard me out up until this point and you say, well that's cool and all, but the thing in your hand looks like it probably tastes like grass. The cool thing about AG1 is that it tastes just fine. The primary ingredient in here is water, but what taste it does have is just like a naturally sweet vanilla taste, and it's something I enjoy in the mornings along with my coffee and breakfast. Overall, from top to bottom, AG1 is a simple, effective solution to start taking care of your body the way that it deserves. And right now, there's never been a better time to get in on this offer. That's because if you head to the link in the description at drinkag1.com slash windagoon, along with your AG1, you will receive these two free gifts. The first gift is five extra days of AG1 in their convenient travel packs, which is even more AG1 that you can take with you on the go. And the second is a year's supply of vitamin D3 and K2. Just put a drop of this in your drink in the morning to get even more of the vitamins that you need. So once again, to get these two free gifts, head to the link in the description at drinkag1.com slash windagoon to get in on this fantastic offer and start taking care of your body the right way today. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to AG1 for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Before we get into tier four, one thing I wanna correct up here. For one, yeah, I made all the names smaller so that we can fit all of the future names up on the whiteboard. But while I was doing that, I thought about it and I have absolutely no idea why I didn't put Skinwalker at S tier. I don't know what kind of fog I was in during tier three. Skinwalker is one of the most famous cryptids of all time. It's one of the most terrifying. It's got the most lore. It's one of the key creatures people think about when they hear the word cryptid. So yeah, my apologies. I don't know what came over me. We're gonna fix that now. With that out of the way, let's get in to tier four, beginning with sewer gators. This urban legend is as widespread as it is feared. While nearly every major American city has some mythos surrounding the sewer gator, the most famous example is that of New York City. During the 1920s, stories began to rise of pet owners adopting baby alligators while on vacation, and then after returning home and realizing the level of care needed to house such a creature, 
flushing them into the city's sewer system. Hundreds of illegal pet alligators are confiscated each year, leading many to speculate that some subterranean reptiles may haunt our cities. Sewer gators is a classic, and while it's a bit of a stretch to call it a cryptid because last I checked, alligators are real, the idea of them being flushed into city sewer systems is an insanely popular urban legend. Now, would a real baby alligator almost immediately be killed by all the bacteria in a raw sewage system? Yes. But that's what's fun about the myth, because different variations have their own different caveats that, oh, this alligator was special and had a resistance to bacteria, or maybe, oh, well, this area is particularly irradiated or whatever, so we've got this, like, radioactive super gator. I've talked about it before in the series, but one of my favorite things cryptids do is make you afraid of the dark. It, in specific scenarios, there's different creatures that will keep you up at night, depending on where you're at. And it, I just remember being a kid and passing like manholes and always thinking there could be something down there. And I love that. Urban areas don't get a lot of cryptids because of just, you know, the way that they are. Not a lot of woods or things to go bump in the night, but it's cool that the sewer is this kind of uncharted area within cities and it has its own cryptid. That's really neat. That being said, it's not super unique in and of itself, but I like the location, so let's call it C tier. I don't even think you all can see that. It's so small. Hold on, I have an idea. I'll make the names big while I'm recording the tier that they're on, and then after I'm done recording, I'll erase the names and make them small. That way over the course of the tier, you can see where things rank out. That is, of course, until I get lazy and decide to not do that. Next up, we have the Bukovac. This creature of Slavic mythology was said to prey on those who found themselves too close to the water's edge. Unlike predators who kill in search of food, this demon kills for the sake of killing, strangling its victims and leaving their bodies to rot on the shore. From its description of a monstrous amphibian with crooked horns to the presence of animals and humans found abandoned and choked of life, it's no wonder as to why the ponds and rivers of Central Europe are to be approached with caution. I know I'm cheating a little bit by putting some creatures from mythology on a cryptid list, but if at some point in history people have thought these things are real, then it counts. Because of that, the Bukovac shows up as an expressly evil entity or an antagonist in a lot of Slavic mythology. Like characters from Slavic stories know to stay away from the rivers for fear of the creature, or perhaps the creature kills a character within the story. It gets points for uniqueness. I like the idea of a giant deer frog thing that jumps out of rivers and kills you. But that being said, there isn't a ton to the creature's lore besides how it's used in other stories. So I would put it at C tier, but I feel like the fact that it's directly from mythology means it has to lose some points, so I'll, we'll call it a D. After that, we have the Makalala. Tanzania holds the legend of a creature described by explorers as a quote, troubling bird. Described as standing seven to eight feet tall, this beast towered over the assumedly tallest birds of the region, such as the ostrich, and on top of that, had the ability to fly. Early explorers of around 1870 said the people describe it as a bird of prey that can only be killed when the hunter plays dead. Its name meaning noisemaker, the creature was even said to clap the plates of its wings together to cause an obnoxious racket. Given its consistency in stories among different tribes and reports of tribal leaders wearing their skulls, perhaps a creature once, or still does, exist within Tanzania that changes our understanding of biological possibilities. I like some of the finer details of the story. The fact there's a creature called Noisemaker because it slaps its wings together. Like, it's not just a tall, scary bird. There's extra dimensions to the creature that make it feel more real, like it's a thing that's been seen by multiple people. And as we've talked about before, there's a ton of examples of creatures we've once believed to be extinct that have just popped back up in the historical record. So maybe some kind of giant bird did go extinct around the late 1800s. It's very believable, and I think that's pretty cool. At the same time, big bird. So, D tier. Next up we have the Mapinguari, and I'm going to continue to pronounce that however I feel really. The jungles of Brazil hold legend of this bizarre creature. Classic tales of the beast describe it as a shaman who was transformed into a hairy cyclops with backwards feet and a mouth on its stomach. 
The creature is ferocious and is said to eat the heads of humans unlucky enough to cross its path. Despite its odd appearance, many zoologists have used sightings of the creature as evidence of a still existent species of giant sloth. With the reputation for carnage and nearly 100 recorded sightings by zoologist David Oren, this monster is a legend as feared as it is strange. What have I been saying for so long in this series? If you're going to have a regional cryptid, then make it unique. I am tired of seeing Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster just copy-pasted into different parts of the world. And if no one else got me, I know Brazil's got me, because you all are so weird, and I love it. Every Brazilian cryptid I come across is exactly what I'm talking about. It is bizarre, it's strange, it's terrifying, it makes no sense. But if your region's gonna have a Bigfoot, then why not have it be a shaman who became a giant mouth, belly, cyclops thing? Its feet are backwards so that when you see the tracks and try to run away from it, you're actually getting closer. That's great. And yeah, sure, a bunch of nerds went into the jungle and said that people seeing this creature proves there's probably a giant sloth or something, but I don't care. I'm here for the belly mouth. I would give it an A tier, but it's almost too insane. Like, too many weird details to call it within the realm of reality. Like, sure, a lot of my, like, A tier, S tier stuff is weird, but it kind of makes sense to the region or area it's in, or at the very least, its abilities kind of flow together. Like, the Wendigo, for example. Like, sure, it can shapeshift and stuff like that, but it's connected to the reason the creature exists in the first place and the beliefs of the region or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm not Brazilian, I'm not super knowledgeable about Brazil, but I don't think Cyclops and again belly mouths are a normal part of their culture, probably. So I feel like for flying a little too close to the sun, I'm going to bring it down to B tier, but just know it's a B plus in my heart. And to follow that up, we have the Ninjin. Deep beneath the waters of Antarctica, this impossible beast stalks the frigid ice skate. The first mention of this creature came from Japan in 2007 when a user claimed that a ship spotted one of these creatures off the coast of Antarctica, with subsequent sightings occurring ever since. While specifics change between spotted variants, every iteration contains two limbs, white skin, and otherwise subdued, almost human features. Given the inhospitable, alien geography of Antarctica, it is fitting that the cryptid of its frozen interior shares in its uncanny horror. The Ninjin is a personal favorite of mine. Antarctica is probably the most terrifying place on Earth. We don't think about it a lot because it's so far removed from the rest of civilization, but it's the most inhospitable climate on the planet. There's so many stories of researchers or scientists who are down in Antarctica and they talk about how at night the scenery begins to play tricks on you because all that your mind has to work off of is the flat darkness and the sound of wind rushing against the ice and you begin to imagine things that are out there that you know can't be but you're convinced are and the ninja so perfectly encapsulates that feeling for one the word ninja translates to human so that's a menacing aspect in itself these creatures that are seen stalking the ice are simply humans, or at least the closest thing Antarctica can create to humans. And there's something about them, especially the ones you see online beneath the water. It looks like some primordial ancestor to humanity, or some alien civilization that exists beneath Antarctica that's been trying to mimic humanity for a millennia. It so perfectly encapsulates the most terrifying parts about its location in a creature. They're so mysterious, they're so scary, I absolutely love them. To be honest, I would put them in S tier if they didn't first pop up online in 2007. So, minus points for recency, I'm going to call it an A tier. Ultimately, if I find myself thinking about the horrors and implication of a creature after I've gotten done reading about it, then it's done its job. And the ninja has never fully left my mind since I first read about it years ago. So, it deserves its spot. And to now shift gears very dramatically, Let's talk about the squonk. In the forest of Pennsylvania, there exists a creature so ugly that it can do nothing but mourn its own appearance. He is described in Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods as such. Quote, The squonk is of a very retiring disposition, generally traveling about at twilight and dusk. 
Because of its misfitting skin, which is covered with warts and moles, it is always unhappy. Hunters who are good at tracking are able to follow a squonk by its tear-stained trail, for the animal weeps constantly. When cornered, an escape seems impossible, or when surprised and frightened, it may even dissolve itself into tears." End quote. The creature avoids its own reflection and, aside from recent iterations which detail misfortune to those who hunt the creature, the squonk has no ability to harm others beyond fear brought about by its wailing at night. While tragic, the squonk legend is a cultural favorite if, for nothing else, its unique, pitiful existence. The squonk is so pathetic and that's why people love it. It is so ugly it can't stop crying, and that's all it does. A lot of the stories around the squonk will have details like someone catches one in a bag, and then when they bring it home and open the bag, it's just full of tears, because the creature's only escape is it melts into tears. All the women that I talked to, my wife, absolutely love the squonk because they see it as like a poor, sad baby that just needs to be protected. And yeah, I mentioned that in some iterations of the tale, people can get hurt whenever they go hunting for the squonk, but most of the time that's because like they touch the tears and then they get so sad that they can't stop crying either. So literally the only thing the squonk can do to fight back is cry on you. He's very sad and also very ugly. So we'll give some pity points and put him at B tier. I know a lot of people really like the squonk, and if enough people yell at me, I may move him, but for now, we'll leave him there. Next up, we have the Shanka Moroccan. This beast, whose name translates to carrying off dogs, was supposedly a hyena-like creature that roamed the lands of North America. This wolf became feared by settlers when stories arose of this solitary hunter slaughtering farm animals. As recently as 1995, new stories have come to light as cryptozoologists like Mark Hall and Lauren Coleman have found still persistent sightings of the creature among the Iowa people. In 2005, a string of livestock killings in Montana culminated in the hunting of a wolf that many believe to be the Shunka Warakin. Perhaps this breed of solitary apex canines may have once, or still might, terrorize the American Rockies. A lot of stories and legends around this creature are pretty cool because, again, its name's carrying off dogs. That's neat. And it's also very Americana to have these individual stories of settlers just outside of town who, instead of having their animals attacked by a pack of wolves, only saw one very large wolf slaughter their farm. It's also very neat how people like Lauren Coleman, the goat of cryptozoology, are continuing to make advancements in the stories and sightings of the creature to this day. And all of those details narrowly save it from F tier. Because yeah, it's a hyena-like wolf, also known as a wolf, in America. That's just really big and by itself. Again, if it wasn't for the cool name or cool stories, it's straight to the bottom, but we'll call it D tier. After that, we have the Yamakachi. This mega serpent is said to stalk the snowy peaks of Mount Tsurugi, Japan. The locals tell legend of snakes reaching impossible lengths and swallowing up those unfortunate enough to find themselves alone near the mountain's border. In 1973, a group of forestry workers spotted a black snake they described as being over 30 feet in length. Local legend says that Mount Tsurugi was once a man-made pyramid before nature took it over and that deep within its caverns lies some forgotten treasure of rulers now unknown. The same legend says a great serpent stands watch at the mountain, ready to guard a prize that only it remembers. Given the reoccurrences of modern sightings, there may be more to this story than just fairy tale. For one, giant snakes are objectively cool, see Megaconda for my thoughts. But a giant snake within the snowy mountains of Japan, that's pretty cool. And a giant snake within the mountains of Japan that's guarding an underground pyramid, that is fantastic. Not only is it a really cool giant snake, but it's got its own lore. And just the idea that it's like a dragon guarding its hoard of gold, there's so much you could do with that from stories that you could write about it to the fear you would have on the mountain at night. It's great, I love it. 
Normally my rule is whichever cryptid goes first gets placed higher than everything else. Like for example, Bigfoot got A tier and then other Bigfoot knockoff stuff is beneath it. So normally I would put the Yamagachi, Yam Yamakachi, whatever, I would put it at C tier because the Megaconda is on B tier, but because the Yamakachi does so much cool stuff with what it's got, I'm going to put it on B tier with the Megaconda. It's now occurring to me I put way too much thought into this, but whatever. After that, we have water lions. Across the rivers of Central Africa, a peculiar description of aquatic felines circulates local stories. Water lions is a catch-all term for sightings of saber-toothed predators said to kill humans and take down prey as large as hippos. Variants such as the Marunago of Chad are said to reach lengths of 12 feet and others are said to hunt in packs, in which one chases the prey into the water only to be beset by a horde of killers. Consistency across sightings leads some to believe that an unusually large, semi-aquatic cat stalks the waters of the African continent. So yeah, the water lion isn't one specific creature or series of creatures in an area. It's more so just a catch-all for a bunch of different tribes and villages and groups of people within that area of Central Africa for the past couple hundred years who have reported seeing an aquatic species of cat that hunt in packs and can take down big prey animals. Cool and all, um, F tier. We are talking about Antarctica people and shapeshifters. I don't care that your cat can go in the water. Yes, I'm sure that if I was on a riverboat in Africa and saw like 20 lions come out of the water to attack me, I would be pretty scared. But until that happens, I don't care. And then joining the water lions in the loser circle, we have the dodo. Okay, that was a bit mean. I'll tone it down for now. The dodo was a, at one time, existent species of flightless bird native to Meridius Island. Standing roughly three feet tall, the dodo had no true means of defense besides a potentially nasty bite. Dodos thrived in their natural habitat until in the late 1600s when sailors arriving to the island discovered the defenseless dodo to be an appetizing food source. The dodo went extinct so quickly that until the 19th century, many believed the creature to be a myth. In recent years, various sightings have occurred on islands along the coast of Africa and throughout the Indian Ocean, leaving many to imagine the poor victim of overzealous hunting to now have a second chance. Before I put it at F tier, I want to clarify I do feel bad for the dodo. It's very sad that you can just be a very cute, fat bird, and then one day the Portuguese show up, and that's it. It's, this isn't funny. It's kind of funny, but it shouldn't be funny. Uh, apparently, like, they were so slow that you didn't even have to try to hunt them. You could just, like, have a club and just, like, walk up to it. And this poor bird, who has no natural predators, doesn't know it should be scared. And then over the course of, like, a few months, they go from everywhere on the islands to non-existent. <laughs> so I do, I do feel bad for it. But that being said, as a cryptid, as a supernatural, you know, possibly real creature, to just say maybe they all didn't die, which to clarify, I hope they didn't all die. It'd be really cool if there's some out there. Uh, but that being said, not a really cool cryptid. So yes, it, it's an F tier, but I do miss him. Next up we have the Amboy Jaguar. Paraguay holds tale of a rather unique water serpent. While initial details match that of Nessie adjacent cryptids, such as a length of nearly 100 feet and stalking of inland waterways, that is where the similarities end, as this beast is also said to have a hooked tail used for catching prey and the head of a dog, which it uses to bark. Smaller renditions of the creature were spotted by 20th century explorers and described as a slug-like snake. The serpent finds itself at home with local legends of the region, such as that of giant catfish and other waterborne predators. Consistencies across the region's people lend credence to this bizarre beast, as does the uniqueness of reported encounters. Yes, it's another water serpent, but it's got the head of a dog and a weird hook on its tail. So I do recognize that there's some creativity going on, but it's still a kind of snake serpent-like river thing. 
So while in my head it's higher than a lot of the other Loch Ness ripoffs, I would put it at C tier if it had just a little bit more lore to its creation or you know did something cool other than just barking. So I'm putting it at D tier, but think of it as a D plus. I do appreciate the originality, I just wish there was more of it. But if being unique is something that you like, then you're gonna love this next one. Because up next, we have the Kappa. Among the library of strange Japanese creatures, the Kappa finds itself to be exceptionally weird. The Kappa is best described as a turtle-human hybrid, standing up to four feet tall and varying in color from green to blue. The Kappa have a bowl-shaped dent on the top of their head that is constantly filled with water, being unable to move when the water is spilled. The most common method of defense against these creatures is to bow, causing the creature to politely return the favor and spill the water from its head. Defense is needed as these creatures, while often just troublesome, in some stories drown those who find themselves alone near the water's edge and in others outright disemboweling their victims. Many odd rules and folklore revolve around the creature, such as their love of cucumbers and apt sumo abilities. I will say it again, if no one else got me for weird monsters, I know Brazil and Japan got me. I complain that most of these aren't that unique. This is a turtle man who has water in a dent in his head that gives him power, and sometimes he'll just pull pranks on people, and other times he'll tear them into pieces. There are so many weird stories about the Kappa. There are stories about, I swear I'm not kidding, they get into farting competitions <laughs> with like fishermen. They like cucumbers, so if you want to go bathe in a river that has a Kappa in it, you're supposed to throw a cucumber in the water as like a peace offering. Uh, if you like beat them in a fight, they're forced to become subservient to you and they'll do house chores for you, but they also have like advanced knowledge of medicine and farming. Like, the <laughs> there's so much weird lore. Like that mention I had about disemboweling. So there, there's a belief in some like Japanese folklore legends that there's an organ deep within your gut that is where your soul is located. Um, so the Kappa, to get to it, reaches up, you can guess, up what and then just starts ripping intestines out to get to the organ um so like the, the cap is strange because in some situations it's so weird and absurd but in others be careful bathing in the river because a turtle man might pull your guts out <laughs> and also yes this is where the koopa from mario comes from the inspiration for it at least i kind of want to give it an a tier just because it's so bizarre, it's like gnarly, but also really strange. I don't know if it's an A tier, it could be, here, I'll put it at A tier, but it's a low A. Like it's at A because of how unique it is. I think it's a little too crazy, but something about, I don't know, something about it just puts it ahead of like the Pinguari for me, that it's like, it goes the extra length of being insane that I respect it. Yeah, why not? I'll put it at A. It, it gave us Bowser. Actually, after looking at that, seeing Kappa up there with like Bigfoot and Goatman and the Ninja, that doesn't feel right. I'm calling it B tier. Again, this for some reason is what's important to me. Another thing I want to mention down here in the non-applicable is the sightings of giant catfish around the world. Because similar to a lot of other creatures we've talked about, Typically, if several different isolated groups of people from around the world report seeing the same creature, then those stories likely came from somewhere. The largest catfish we've ever found can reach lengths of up to 9 feet and get over 600 pounds. But there's stories of catfish over double that length and over a thousand pounds. If I was just calling it a cryptid, it would be F tier because, again, big fish. But it's how commonplace stories of giant catfish are that I think makes them more important to what we're talking about than just their existence as a cryptid. We often discredit the opinions of people who we consider to be less intelligent or less studied than us, and take for granted the fact that people who have lived in a region for hundreds if not thousands of years suddenly saying a creature has shown up that's different than the ones they're used to should probably be taken into account. I also just noticed 
I put water lines and dodo in non-applicable. I meant to put them in F. My brain saw bottom of the list and just wrote them there. I'm so stupid. Hold on. But thanks to everyone who gave me free engagement for yelling at me in the comments that I put them in the wrong spot. You're not allowed to delete those comments, by the way. It's the rules. And going off of giant catfish, continuing two big scary things in the water, we have Luska. The Caribbean is home to this frightening legend. Luska is a shark-octopus hybrid said to stalk the waters of blue holes near Andros. Depending on the tail, Luska is between 70 to 200 feet long. If that wasn't frightening enough, Luska can even change its color to best camouflage itself into the surrounding environment, and during the day, hides in undersea caves. While many fishermen believe the shark hybrid to be far-fetched, many do attest to some massive squid being occasionally spotted and chasing away other large predators, such as shark. Regardless of opinion, the legend of Luska will continue to haunt the Caribbean for generations to come. Luska is a ton of fun. In some stories, it's the shark-octopus hybrid, and in others, it's just a really big squid. I like the shark-octopus hybrid because for one, it's funny, and also it differentiates Luska from things like the Kraken. And that's just a great fisherman's tale. You can imagine tourists coming into the region and being warned of the giant shark octopus thing that could be hiding in a cave beneath where they go swimming. Because the descriptions of it vary so much and there's not a clearly defined like narrative or you know core description around Luska, like the links change so much between stories and stuff like that, I can't really give it B tier, but I will call it a solid C tier. After that, let's move on to a more normal cryptid. Bat Squatch. This flying beast was first spotted near Mount St. Helens in 1994. Despite its name, the creature more resembles a werewolf than it does Bigfoot, aside from its ape-like body, with a dog-like face, yellow or red eyes depending on the story, and leathery bat wings. Standing 9 to 15 feet tall and with wings up to 50 feet wide, Bat Squatch has been reported to terrorize helicopters and motorists near the mountain. Legend has it that the beast erupted from the mountain along with the eruption of Mount St. Helens and is a long forgotten primate torn from the caverns beneath the mountain and forced to fly among those who walk on the surface. Bat Squatch is so weird and strange. You take a werewolf and give him kind of like a Bigfoot torso and giant bat wings. The stories of him are really fun too, like a trucker driving through the mountain at night and then he sees something flash in front of the truck. It's like very Jeepers Creepers. And then he gets out and sees this 15 foot tall creature spread its wings and take off up the mountain. Or stories of helicopters flying over and just barely catching a glimpse of this massive glider thing curving around the backside of a mountain. It's a lot of fun, especially the idea that when the mountain erupted, it was like cast out of some hollow earth cavern, which of course has a special place in my heart. It's a ton of fun. I love the creature. Sure, a lot of it is fanciful for the sake of having these crazy out there elaborate stories, and that hurts it a little bit as far as the authenticity around the legends, and it's, you know, got recency or whatever, but I still think it's got the makings of a solid B tier, mostly because it's cool. And keeping it rolling with really weird cryptids, next up we have the Pukwudgie. Unique in name and appearance, this Wampanoag legend hails from the woods of the New England United States. Pukwudgies are explicitly supernatural creatures, said to vanish at will and shapeshift into multiple forms, the most common of which being a troll porcupine hybrid standing roughly three feet tall. The creature is not only intelligent, but skilled in its sorcery with the ability to summon fire and other defenses. In some myths, the being is friendly and, if anything, mischievous, while in others, the monster is violent and murderous. The similarities between this Native American creature and European folklore raise interesting and frightening questions about what may have once lurked our forests. The Pukwudgie is really unique and I love it for that, but what's really interesting about it is that thing I mentioned at the end that it feels like a creature out of like some Western European fairy tale. Think about it, how many Native American creatures do you know that have sorcery and can summon fire? 
Sure, the Native American stories had a lot of magic, but the Pukwudgie feels at home in a lot of European folktale. It's a very interesting narrative point to imagine how these similarities developed between cultures separated by an ocean. Maybe it says something greater about the expeditions of people across the globe. Who knows? The Pukwudgie itself is very weird and strange, and I think it's earned a spot at B tier. Also, with that stuff about it seeming European, it also definitely has Native American aspects. I'm not saying it doesn't have any. Like, there's elements of it being a bad omen if spotted, and the detail of being a malicious shapeshifter seen in a lot of different Native American legends. So I'm not saying it's like an entirely ripped off European idea. I'm just saying it's interesting because it seems like a fusion between the two cultures. Before we get into the last two cryptids for this tier, there's a couple other NAs that I want to bring up. For one is mammoth sightings. So the woolly mammoth, giant hairy elephant thing went extinct, ice age, whatever, blah blah blah. What's interesting is there's some belief that the woolly mammoth went extinct much later than most people believe. As natives of the northernmost part of the North American continent have tribal stories relating to sightings of the creature in the past several hundred years. Creatures that they would describe as very large moose that had a very long nose and its horns were underneath its head instead of on top of them. Mammoth sightings is an example of both creatures we once thought to be extinct, maybe popping back up into the historical record, but it's also an example, if we are to believe that maybe mammoth sightings occurred after they were believed to be extinct, of people seeing a creature that is completely unidentifiable to them, but we know to be something that at once existed, is cataloged, etc. So maybe some of these creatures that we hear about in other parts of the world, something that they describe as these great long sea serpents or lion-like creatures or what have you, maybe it's something that we as a collective absolutely know what it is. The people of the region just don't recognize it because it's out of place. Things to consider as we talk about some of these cryptids. On that same note, let's also talk about the Gulf coelacanth. So the coelacanth we talked about earlier in the series. It was a species of fish that was believed to be extinct for millions and millions of years that in the 1930s just popped up off the coast of Africa. It's an example of creatures we believe to be extinct showing back up in the historical record and because of that, the guy has kind of become a symbol of cryptozoology as a whole. The Gulf coelacanth is interesting because how it reshapes our idea of other cultures' interpretations of once believed mythological creatures. Because throughout the 17-1800s, there's been many descriptions written of fish that many believe to be coelacanth. There have been paintings and sculptures made of fish that resemble coelacanth. And again, during the time that these things were being seen, it was believed that the coelacanth was an either extinct or mythological creature. But then, whenever the creature reappears, the narrative suddenly changes. Maybe all the artwork and writings we were seeing wasn't of a fictional creature. Maybe they actually saw a coelacanth while it was alive. That raises two points. For one, how much of art and stories that we write off for granted as just stories about fiction could have been something that was real, at least for the people of the time? And two, the Gulf of Mexico is a pretty far away from Southern Africa. So is it possible that the coelacanth, even if it's not extinct now, was at one point much more diverse across the globe? And to that same effect, how many other creatures that went extinct or disappeared from one location on the earth could still exist just somewhere else. That ties back into the mammoth sightings thing I was saying about people calling a creature they see this impossible, unable to understand beast when in reality it's something known just somewhere else. It raises an interesting point about how we understand these sightings and how we understand cryptozoology as a whole. With that out of the way, let's talk about the Deep Star 4000 fish. Off the coast of California in 1966, the crew of a submersible called the Deep Star 4000 spotted a behemoth. According to the crew, at a depth of roughly 4,000 feet off the coast of San Diego, they momentarily came face to face with a massive fish staring into their vessel. While aesthetically, the fish resembled a sea bass, the length of this creature was estimated to be between 25 to 30 feet in length. Scientists have speculated for decades since as to what the crew saw, with theories ranging from a colossal variant of sleeper shark to a yet unidentified species of bony fish. 
What can be made sure, however, is that the Deep Star 4000 fish serves as a chilling reminder that with every journey into the depths, new nightmares are uncovered. This is like classic sci-fi movie scenario. Crew is in a submarine, looks out the window and sees a giant eye that one of the crew members described as massive dinner plates. Looking into the ship, it swims by, and oh look, it's bigger than the submarine you're in. That's great. The most common theory around it is that it was some kind of super massive shark, like a sleeper shark, even though the crew members specifically described it as large eyes and sleeper sharks don't in compared to their size. But again, this thing would be like over double the length of the largest known sleeper sharks or even species like Greenland shark. This would be way bigger. So maybe it's some unidentified species of shark that's just got really big eyes. But the most important takeaway is that we don't know what's down there in the ocean. And seemingly every time we go looking for something weird and new, we find it. The ocean is a terrifying, unexplainable place and the Deep Star 4000 fish is a perfect example of that. I would normally call it D tier just because big fish, right? Uh, but I like the setup for it. I, I like the lore of a submarine crew and that's bigger than the submarine and all the theories that are around it. To me, it's like scarier than a lot of the D tier fish stuff. So for that, I'll, I'll call it a C tier. I don't know, there's something about the vagueness of it that makes it so much more terrifying to me than stuff like, you know, the Loch Ness Monster or whatever. Stuff that isn't like poked at or looked at time and time again. It was just one encounter for a brief second and then we never saw it again. Because yeah, why would we? There's so much other stuff out there to run into. It was just a chance encounter. Basically, it's a D tier cryptid, but it's scary, so it's bumped up to C. And then finally, for tier four, we have the Pinatubo monsters. The Zambales region of Luzon, Philippines holds a surprisingly modern legend so fierce, it has scared fishermen of the region back to the shores. Beginning in January of 2002, reports began popping up of several eel-like serpents said to be three feet wide and seven feet long. The locals seemed so convinced of their sightings, in fact, that some villages, such as that of Labuan, abandoned the generational practice of fishing and rather opted to change the diet of their entire society for fear of what may be lurking in the water. Given the recency, consistency, and dedication of these stories, many believe some undocumented species of lake serpent to haunt the waters of the inland Philippines. This cryptid has so much legitimacy to me, at least compared to other similar, you know, river serpent sightings. Because there's these villages in the central Philippines where their entire life revolves around the river. All the food they eat comes from fish that are fished out of the river and all of the village's income comes from selling the fish to outsiders. So if a group of people whose entire lives and town is built on that, it takes something pretty substantial to scare them away from the water. The people of the village opted to start frog hunting instead. And all of the sightings from the area are very consistent in the size and description of the creature, describing them as like these slimy eel things that look like giant leeches that move in packs of three or four across the top of the water. There's stories of kids thinking it's a log and then they throw a rock at it only to have the creature swim away. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that representatives of the state government went out to these villages to conduct a survey, with the main finding that was reported back to the government being that it was probably just a school of tilapia. But see, that doesn't make any sense because these people are generational fishermen of tilapia. So why would they catch a few and then one day see a bunch and think it's some kind of sea monster? I know, again, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the time, People like to point at the less educated or whatever and be like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about because they're stupid or whatever. But there's no other scenario that would be an acceptable answer. If you had a guy who didn't know how to read or write who was like a cow farmer and he said there was a monster on his property, you wouldn't be like, oh, do you think he just saw a bunch of cows? Like regardless of what we're talking about, like education or whatever, why would people who have fished for tilapia their whole life see a bunch of tilapia and then be convinced it's a monster and never fish again? I think there's something to it. I think it's very possible that some kind of amphibian or serpent that's yet to be identified has been in the water. I would normally call the Pinatuba monster like a D tier because it's just a big eel in the water, right? But because of the consistency between claims 
and the dedication of people in the region. I'm tempted to call it a C tier, if not a B tier, just because of how hauntingly realistic a lot of the claims are. I'll call it a C tier because it's like the cryptid itself isn't cool enough to be a B tier, but I really do appreciate the stories around it and it gives a sense of legitimacy to maybe all these crazy people out there who are seeing things that go bump in the night aren't so crazy after all. And with that, we have the end of tier four. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. That's the end of tier four. Uh, tier five gets into more of the like humanoid stuff, I think. But then like later tiers go back to a lot of ocean monsters. Like I said, this whole chart's varied uh, and full of weird stuff all the way down. And hopefully you all continue to enjoy the series. And thank you so much for sticking with it up until this point. And again, thank you for watching. Don't really have a lot to add. Again, hope you enjoyed. Check out the podcast. They're going fantastic. Uh, yeah, for, again, for those that don't know, I have a podcast with Meat Canyon, and I've got a podcast with Moist Critical and Jackson Clark. Both of those are linked in the description. Uh, that comes out, each one comes out every other week in alternating weeks. So that means every weekend, I have a new episode on one of those two shows. They're going fantastic. I'm glad that you all enjoy them. Um, but with Meat Canyon, I cover stories of the supernatural, creepy pastas, things that go bump in the night. And then over on the Red Thread uh, with Jackson and Charlie, we talk about cold case, cults, conspiracies, etc. So something for everyone between the two. Uh, so yeah, go check those out. They're going great. Thank you all so much for the support you've been showing over there. And either in the next video or the one after that, there should be a very cool merch announcement. Um, you guys have been so great with the merchandise up until this point and it means the world. So that's kind of unlocked the resources for me to put together some really interesting and unique things that I think you all are going to like. Uh, and again, thank you all so much for the support you've shown me on those already. I can't say thank you enough. It means the world. Uh, but hopefully I want to use this momentum to get even more cool stuff for you all. And I greatly appreciate the support you all give me in return. It means the world. So thank you. Uh, but yeah, I'll go ahead and get started editing this so you all can see it sooner. Uh, I hope you all enjoy. And yeah, I'm already excited for the next part of the series. So I believe that should do it for now. But I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one.